Assalamu alaikum everyone, welcome to another ATP video. Today we will talk about a topic that was heavily requested by our lovely audience. You probably have guessed it right, or have read the title. We will talk about nematodes. Without further ado, let's begin with a quick recap. Generally speaking, parasites can be divided into two main groups, protozoa and helminths. Helminths are then subdivided into two big groups, platyhelminths, which are flatworms, and nematodes, which are roundworms. The platyhelminths group is further categorized into cystodes, which are tapeworms, and trematodes, which are flukes. Keep in mind that worms infections are often accompanied by eosinophilia. We know they seem a lot, but the good news is that we in ATP have already done videos on all of them. So don't worry, you can easily cover them. In this video, we will complete our series and talk about nematodes. Nematodes are also known as roundworms. They vary in size. For some organisms, they are microscopic, and some of them are tens of centimeters, like Ascaris lumbricoides. Not all nematodes are parasitic in nature, and even the parasitic ones can be plant or animal specific, which means they don't exhibit parasitic activity against humans. In this video, we will focus on clinically important human specific nematodes. We will divide the nematodes into two big groups, intestinal, which mainly affects the GI tract, and tissue related, which can affect different tissues, but tissue nematodes will be covered in another video inshallah. Their names are a mouthful, so practice saying them while we go along. Let's remember this mnemonic for intestinal nematodes. EAST So E for Enterobius vermicularis, A for Ascaris lumbricoides, the second A is for Ankylostoma and Nicator americanus, then the S is for Strongyloides stercoralis, the T is for Trichinella spiralis, and, and the final T is for Trichurus trichiura. They're pretty hard to pronounce, gotta give them that. Also, throughout this video of intestinal nematodes, once we ask you about the treatment, kindly don't hesitate to say it's bendazole, because statistically speaking, 99% of the time, you'll be correct. The first nematode on the list is Enterobius vermicularis. It's also known as pinworm, which can lead to enterobiasis. In the developed countries, Enterobius vermicularis is the most common type of worm infection. Now, how is it transmitted? It's transmitted fecal-orally, when humans ingest contaminated food or hands reach to the mouth that has pinworm eggs. So, it's a human-to-human -human transmission. Then, eggs mature into larvae, which live in the small intestine. At night, gravid pinworm migrates to the perianal region to lay down its eggs. Now for the symptoms. Some people are asymptomatic, while others might show symptoms that are particularly related to the perianal area including itchiness, specifically at night, therefore affecting the quality of sleep. It's worth mentioning that children are among the commonly affected age group with pinworms. Now for the diagnosis. Enterobius vermicularis can be diagnosed using tape tests, which is applied on the perianal area. This test helps visualize pinworm eggs under the microscope. Look at this egg here. You can see its sharp edge, the V, and you can link that to the V in vermicularis. Second nematode that we'll be discussing today is Ascaris lumbricoides, a nematode that's commonly responsible for causing ascariasis in different countries, especially the tropical ones. Ascaris lumbricoides is the longest intestinal nematode, thus its other name is the giant roundworm. Keep its size in mind because it will make perfect sense when we discuss its clinical importance. Ascaris lumbricoides is also transmitted fecal-orally. After ingestion, eggs go to the intestine and then larvae ascend to reach the lung where they mature. Mature forms of Ascaris lumbricoides then go back again to the small intestine to enjoy the rest of its stay, while causing many problems to its host. Man, such a bad guest. Ascaris can cause ascariasis. This infection can be asymptomatic in some patients, while others can have GI symptoms, pain, nausea, vomiting, you name it. In addition, due to its size, it can obstruct many lumens, causing ileocecal valve and biliary obstruction. Moreover, since part of its cycle is in the lung, it can cause respiratory problems like cough and bloody sputum, in addition to Loeffler syndrome, which is characterized by respiratory symptoms plus peripheral eosinophilia. To diagnose Ascaris lumbricoides, we can perform stool studies, looking for its eggs. Under microscopy, 
These eggs have granular pattern and are oval in shape, as you can see here. Third group that we'll be discussing is Ankylostoma species and Nicator americanus. You might be wondering, why two at the same time? But the answer is simple, and that is to make your life easy. Not only that, but also because these two share many similarities, so it's better to group them together. Ankylostoma includes many species, but Ankylostoma duodenale is the commonly associated species with human infections. However, other species of Ankylostoma can also cause diseases in humans. These two are also known as hookworms, and if you look at their structure, you'll know why. Their heads are bent in a way which forms a hook-like structure. Unlike the previous two nematodes, Ankylostoma species and Nicator are transmitted through the skin penetration mainly, and not through the fecal oral route. Their larvae, known as filariform, can penetrate the skin, the foot usually, to invade the body. Using the blood as vector, these larvae go to the lungs to mature, and then subsequently migrate to the small intestine, and start sucking your blood. Basically a vampire. For the clinical importance, it's worth mentioning that these worms often stay for a long time in your intestine sucking your blood. So patients usually have iron deficiency anemia, due to chronic blood loss. Moreover, patients can have GI or respiratory symptoms. Cutaneous larva migrants is another problem patients can have due to these hookworms. This happens once they penetrate the skin, but get it entrapped in the superficial layers of the skin, away from the blood vessels. It usually presents on the foot and is characterized by thread-like lesion, irritation, and pruritus. For diagnosis, again, we use stool studies to help visualize eggs under microscopy. And this brings us to the end of the first part of intestinal nematodes. We hope you found it beneficial. In the next part, we will talk about Strongyloides tercoralis, Trichinella spiralis, and finally, Trichurus trichuria. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to receive our latest explanations. And as always, thanks for watching.